The main sections of scripture that we'll be going through this morning is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 to the end, and chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, and then Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 15. There's a four-part outline. Part 1 is a review of the background to Ephesians chapter uh, 4, verse 30 to the end. Part 2, the blessings of forgiveness and the curse of unforgiveness. Part three, the forgiveness of Joseph, who is a type of Jesus. And part four, personal application. So a review of the background to Ephesians 4.30. The blessings of forgiveness, the curse of unforgiveness is part two. Part three, the forgiveness of Joseph, who is a type of Jesus. And part four, personal application. So please turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter four, verse 30. We'll read those to the end and also the first couple of verses of chapter five. We're going to use these verses as a reference point to address the main subject of forgiveness, which is specifically mentioned in chapter 4, verse 32. So let's read through these so we have them fresh in our minds. Ephesians 4, verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and has given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. That brings us to part one, the review uh, to Ephesians, the verses that precede what we just read. So the context of these verses and what preceded them in chapter 4 of Ephesians is Paul's two-part instruction to the Ephesians as to how they are now to live as believers. While these verses are familiar to us, it's good to be reminded of what is supposed to characterize our, our daily lives. So first in verses 17 through 22 of chapter 4, they are to put off the old man, which represents their former life of sinful conduct, and second... They are to put on the new man in verses 23 through 29, which represents a transformed and spirit-filled life created according to God. Then this new life in Christ is created in the very likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Romans 6.19 says, Paul, Paul speaking here, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. The putting off and putting on is analogous to taking off old dirty clothes and putting on new clothes. It represents the purposeful actions of a new believer to now live their life in obedience to God instead of in rebellion to him. Since, still, since sin is still present in the flesh of the transformed person, they must make the effort to put the former life with its lusts and corruption, and put it off, and to put on the new life in Christ, which seeks to honor and glorify God. And this should be evident in their conduct, and it should be evident in how they live every aspect of their daily lives. Now, moving into the five verses for this morning, we'll look at them by way of overview and then focus on the one specific command in verse 32 that, again, is to forgive one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Following the overview, we'll spend the remainder of the message on this command to forgive. So first, the overview, verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of, re of redemption. Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit who is a person and who is God, is grieved when his children refuse to repent of their old ways of sin and by doing so, refuse the righteous ways of their new life. Paul reminds them that it is the Holy Spirit who has guaranteed their eternal redemption for those who believe in Christ, and it is him whom they are grieving if they refuse to obey his instruction. Verses 31 and 32 say, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Verse 32, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. 
These two verses actually summarize the changes that should take place mentioned in verses 17 through 30, where Paul again speaks of putting off and putting on, and they should be evident in the life of a new believer. In verse 31, bitterness reflects a smoldering resentment. Wrath describes rage and the passion of a moment. Anger is a more internal, deep hostility. Clamor is the outward demonstration of strife out of control. And evil speaking is slander and malice, and in general, it's the Greek term for evil. All of these need to be put off by the believer and replaced with the characteristics of verse 32, being kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving. We who have been forgiven of so much by God should forgive comparatively, should forgive the comparatively lesser offenses committed against us by others. I'm moving to chapter 5 in the first two verses. Therefore be imitators or followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Being imitators of God is our highest calling as his ambassadors and as his witnesses. It is the very purpose of our sanctification where we will become more like Jesus if we grow to be more like him as we serve him. In chapter 5, verse 2, Christ's selfless and loving offering of himself for fallen sinful man pleased and glorified the Father. It perfectly demonstrated God's perfect and unconditional love for us. That takes us to part two, the blessings of forgiveness and the curse of unforgiveness. And we'll move again into the main theme of the message, which is verse 32, where it says, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. We live in a society and in a world where there is an utter disregard for forgiveness, but also where it's desperately needed. In recent years, anger, rage, hatred, and hostility have increased exponentially in our country, but especially in these last two years with COVID and the lockdowns and the mandates and the increasing government takeover of our lives and of our freedoms, both fear and anger have risen to a level never before seen. On Friday, on a program, Stand Up For The Truth, for those who are, who are familiar with that, David Fiorazzo interviewed two sisters who each owned a business in De Pere. One owns an Italian coffee shop and the other owns a pizza restaurant. The sister who owned the pizza restaurant is also an RN. She received a notice from the state because a person in her Bible study group reported her to Homeland Security. This was done because she had a conversation with someone about not wearing a mask, and it was her position that it should be up to the individual. Because she's an RN, Homeland Security reported the incident to the state of Wisconsin, and the state government came after her for spreading misinformation, whatever that is. Actually, they're coming after all health care providers who are having similar conversations that the state regards as spreading misinformation. Now, these ladies were reacting more in disbelief. It wasn't hatred or anger. And, well, there was, there was some anger there, righteous anger. But they were reacting more in disbelief, not in hatred or hostility, as they challenged the state's request. This is just one small example of what's taking place all over our country. And of course, there's the Canadian truckers standing for freedom, and there's a similar peaceful American trucker convoy either underway or it soon will be. No matter what type of media you use to keep up with events in our country and in the world, you have probably seen how all of this is intensifying, and you've seen how people are reacting to it. As our country and the world rapidly moves towards tyranny, we need to be careful that the circumstances we are living under do not provide an excuse for our human nature to override and dominate our spiritual nature. And this can happen very easily and very quickly. As ambassadors for Jesus Christ and witnesses for him, how we react in these circumstances needs to represent how he would want us to react. Our spiritual nature needs to rule over us. Our sinful human nature, which was inherited from Adam and Eve in their fallen state, is prone to anger, prone to hostility, prone to bitterness and resentment, prone to hate. 
prone to the desire for revenge, and even prone to murder. It is prone to unforgiveness. The majority of the world is populated by people who are not believers and will who will demonstrate these characteristics to a greater degree as the heat is turned up, so to speak. Please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We've seen these many times, these verses, but we'll take a look at what can be expected of unbelievers as we progress through these last days. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. As you look at this list, is there anything there that's not taking place today? I don't think so. These verses are more true today than ever before, and they describe people who are of their father, the devil. Referring to John chapter 8, 44, where Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees, and others who were with him and who questioned him, he said, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. And I would add, there are many followers of him. I guess I'll stop there. Unbelievers will mask Unbelievers will manifest their true nature as stated in these verses to a greater degree as we progress through the last days, and they will simply cast off all self-restraint and all self-control. There is an increasing trend toward anger and hostility and rage and revenge, and they are glorified in our TV shows, our movies, video games, our music, even cartoons, and on the Internet. Because our society is so saturated with it, anger and hostility and unforgiveness also show up in our schools and in our families. Seldom do you see forgiveness practiced or even mentioned, but it cannot be that way with us. We must guard against these trends, and we must help our children to guard against and being influenced by them. We need to fully recognize the enemy so that we can stand against the enemy. As Christians, we cannot let ourselves be influenced by the culture or by the wrong actions of others no matter how prevalent these actions are. And even if we see them coming from so-called, or from people who call themselves Christians, we cannot come to accept anger and rage and unforgiveness as okay or as normal. And even worse, we cannot come to see unforgiveness as something we are entitled to because someone has done something wrong to us. This could range from avoiding them and not speaking to them to words and actions that are much worse. We cannot come to think that, that is okay because of what's happening around us. It's not okay, it is sin. Our culture promotes this frame of mind and even tells us it is actually healthy for us to be angry when someone commits some type of offense against us. Psychology tells us that anger is how we deal with wrongs committed against us <clears throat> and that we are entitled to be angry. This implies we're also entitled not to forgive. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the Bible, and nothing could be further from the nature of God and Jesus Christ, whom we are striving to become more like. In Matthew chapter 6, right after Jesus gave his disciples the, the, the prayer known as the Our Father or the Lord's Prayer, he says this in verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, these verses do not imply loss of salvation as if someone is saved. They don't imply that. Instead, they speak of how God will not forgive our day-to-day -day sins and everything that that means. If we don't forgive someone else, this implies a loss of blessing from, a loss of blessing from disobedience and, and worse. 
The problem with not forgiving is that unforgiveness imprisons you in your past. As long as you refuse to forgive people of their offenses, you are shackled to the past and you are keeping the pain alive. You choose to love hate and to love anger. You sentence yourself to that reality as unforgiveness becomes part of your daily life. Unforgiveness not only imprisons you in the past, but it produces a deep-seated bitterness. And over time, it metastasizes and distorts how you see the other person and how you see life. Unforgiveness feeds on itself. It produces a strong desire for revenge. It poisons you spiritually and actually can poison you physically as the bitterness and anger grow stronger and consume your mind and your heart. The pain is kept alive and it can paralyze you. One commentator said this, Revenge is natural to man. For example, man is naturally a vindictive being and in consequences, nothing is more difficult to him than forgiveness of injuries. This comment speaks to the natural sinful state of the human heart that is desperately wicked and deceitful beyond comprehension. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Notice that deceit is the first characteristic listed, though. Pride runs deep in our human nature, and it wants revenge. It wants justice on its own terms and not on God's terms. Unforgiveness produces a malignant cancer in your heart that grows way beyond the original cause of the anger, way beyond the original offense. The absence of forgiveness destroys relationships. It's the ultimate destroyer of relationships, and it's the number one destroyer of marriages. It's not money or financial issues that destroys marriages and families, which is what you sometimes hear. It's unforgiveness that destroys them. In John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Forgiveness sets you free. Unforgiveness imprisons you. It is impossible to live in this world on a daily basis and not be offended by someone or not offend someone or be offended by someone. Most of the time, these offenses are not intentional. We are imperfect beings who mess up all the time and who live in a fallen world. Of course, there are going to be offenses in one direction or another. Seldom will there be a day when there aren't any. That then demands forgiveness. Let the offenses go. If there's no forgiveness, then there is the accumulation and intensifying of anger and bitterness and hostility. Many times it lies beneath the surface, it's waiting there like a time bomb to explode. But this means you remove your right to make the other person pay for what they did. If you refuse to talk to them or you refuse to be around the person, then that is punishing the person by removing affection. That is not forgiveness, that is sin. And that is, that is probably, again, the number one killer of marriages. We say we forgive, but then we punish the relationship. Bitterness is anger's effect over time. It villainizes the person it is, tar it is targeted against. It poisons the person who has the anger to the point where they refuse to see or they can't see the other person as a creation of God whom he died for and cares about. It becomes entrenched and it hardens the heart. It makes it almost impossible to love and be in communion in relationship with that person. It destroys a person's witness. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says we must put all this off or put it away. In 1 John 3, uh, 3, chapter 15, the Apostle John says, Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life. The Greek word for hates in this verse is meseo. As used in this verse, it means to detest. Unforgiveness leads to anger and bitterness towards someone. How far is that from detesting them? He who hates or detests his brother is called a murderer in this verse because the sin lies in the inward disposition of the person. The act of murder is only the outward expression. It's not to minimize the act of murder, and most people who hate do not commit the actual act of murder because they fear the consequences. However, just as Jesus equates sexual lust with the actual act of adultery, so it is with equating hatred with the actual, actual act of murder. As Warren Wiresby commented, the inward intent is the same. It has been well said that never is a person more like Satan than when he hates and is angry. And when he allows his anger to fester and intensify and perhaps gets angry to the point of wanting to eliminate the person, which is murder. 
That is, one, that is what unrepented of anger can lead to. Those who are unsaved hate and are angry and seek revenge against those who have offended them. They are of their father, the devil. On the other hand, never is a person more like God than when that person forgives and loves. To forgive does not require the person who committed the offense to ask for forgiveness. To forgive is to make a statement of unearned love. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How many of us have ever asked for forgiveness of every sin we've ever committed? We sin in ways we're not even aware of and therefore have not asked for forgiveness of them. The sin we are aware of in ourselves is a small part of what is actually there. When we die, we will have committed sins that we were not aware of and therefore have never asked for forgiveness of. At times, a person who has offended you will not even realize they've offended you. If you think that forgiveness should only be given when someone asks for it, then you need to do something with salvation only being by grace alone. So how do you know if you've truly forgiven someone? To forgive is to affirm there is no longer, there is no anger, there is no hatred, there is no desire for vengeance, no retaliation, no bitterness. There is a complete absence of all of this. How do you get there? One word, Jesus. Jesus bore our sin and our eternal punishment on the cross. The cost of our forgiveness the cost of our forgiveness is nothing short of the cross and the suffering in the blood of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was on the cross, he forgave those who caused him unbearable and excruciating pain. Luke 23, verse 34 says, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. All the pain, all the torture, he hangs on the cross looking at those who caused him so much wrong, and he asks the Father to forgive them. When we forgive, we are most like Jesus Christ. Here are some word pictures of forgiveness. These are biblical metaphors, but they can help us as we strive to forgive other people. To forgive is to take the key, open the cell door, and let the prisoner walk free. To forgive is to write in large letters across a debt, nothing owed. To forgive is to pound the gavel in a courtroom and declare, not guilty. To forgive is to shoot an arrow so high and so far it can never be found again. To forgive is to grant full pardon to a condemned and sentenced criminal. To forgive is to smash a clay pot into a thousand pieces so it cannot be put back together again. Be aware that self-pity is often one of the main causes of unforgiveness because every man's, right, every man's cause is right in his own eyes. Proverbs 21 verse 2 says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. In other words, the Lord weighs the true intent. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, I say to the glory of God in an utter humility that whenever I see myself before God and realize even something of what my blessed Lord has done for me, I am ready to forgive anybody, anything. Proverbs 19, verse 11 says, the discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. Man does not get any higher on this earth than when he overlooks a transgression. That is the pinnacle of his glory. When he does this, he is most like God. He is at his pinnacle when he forgives and overlooks a transgression. Refusal to forgive allows pride to rule your life versus humility. You can profess humility all you want, but if you refuse to forgive, you are allowing pride to rule your life. In John chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus says, says, Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Proverbs 13, verse 10, By pride comes nothing but strife. James chapter 2, verse 13, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Those of us who are saved and name the name of Jesus ought to be marked by our love, and our love 
manifest itself in forgiveness. Of all human qualities, none is more godlike than forgiveness. None of us would have any relationship to God in a redeeming sense if God were not a forgiving God. None of us would have any chance to demonstrate the gifts of the Holy Spirit because we would not have them without the Holy Spirit being inside of us, which would not happen if God were not a forgiving God. We, are, we who have received salvation have received it because God forgives. Forgiveness is the most godlike act a person can do. If we are the children of God, then we should manifest his nature. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, A new commandment I give you, that you should love one another as I have loved you, that you should also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that love forgives. 13 verses 4 and 5. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. Proverbs 10 verse 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Proverbs 17:9. He who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. 1 Peter 4.8 And above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Think about this. Whoever has offended you has offended God more. If God who is the most offended has forgiven, why can't you? Are you holy, holy, holy as stated in Isaiah 6.3? One commentator asked these questions. Have you established yourself as a higher court? Are you above God? Are you more significant than God? If God who is holy has forgiven the greater offense towards him because he is holy, can't you who are not holy forgive the lesser offense? Do you deserve more than God? Are you a higher and more holy being than God? Shall we who are unholy in a need of constant forgiveness be unwilling to give it? God is the one most offended and constantly offended. If God forgives us this massive accumulated debt of sin that is accumulated during our life, shall we not forgive the smaller debts of others in our lives? This is what the parable, the parable in Matthew 18, chapter 18, 35 is all about where the servant owes the king 10,000 talents but cannot repay it. The king, God, forgives him, yet he refuses to forgive his servant of a much smaller debt. Is he greater than God? Shall we be like that wicked servant who was forgiven yet refuses to forgive others of their smaller offenses against us? In this story of the wicked servant where he was being delivered over to the torturers, Jesus says in Matthew 18, 35, So my heavenly Father will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother of his trespasses. The phrase from his heart, this makes the command all that much stronger. Forgiveness must be from our heart. It must go deep into the very center of our being. It is not simply a surface forgiveness that is done for our own benefit. That is what a non-believer would do. No, forgiveness from the heart is a deep and complete type of forgiveness. Non-believers can forgive, and some do, but they will forgive because it's in their best interest to do so. They understand the damage that unforgiveness can cause and will forgive out of self-interest. But forgiving from the heart is a deeper, God-honoring, self-denying type of forgiveness that requires the help of the Holy Spirit. God forgives, therefore we forgive. That is humility. Humility must triumph over pride so that forgiveness can triumph over unforgiveness. This is the essence, the core of being a Christian, our forgiveness of others. When you and I became Christians, we signed up for this. We willingly signed up to carry our cross each day, as Jesus mentioned in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It is our pride and our self-will that need to be nailed to the cross. We willingly signed up to follow Jesus by being in submission and by obeying all of his commands, not just some of them. 
we do not fight or wrestle against the flesh and blood. We do not fight or wrestle against flesh and blood, as stated in Ephesians chapter six, verses ten through seventeen, but instead against the rulers of darkness and against spiritual wickedness. In these verses, we are told to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand in the evil day, which is actually a reference to every day. When you, when you and I became a Christian, we signed up for daily battle, not to be fought on our own, but with the help of the Holy Spirit. With him and only with him is the battle winnable. We know that God will allow testings and trials to come into our lives, and many times these come as offenses committed against us by others. We should see these offenses committed against us in the light of the following verses that we're going to read. They tell us of trials and testings that we need to go through and handle in a way that glorifies God through our obedience to his word, in a way that glorifies God by forgiving others just as Jesus forgave us. 1 Peter 1, verses 6 through 9. In this you greatly rejoice, though for now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 8, whom, not, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. And we, as we've talked about in the past about 1 Peter, it was written to encourage believers who are going through extreme persecution and suffering. Ongoing sanctification seldom happens with quantum leaps or giant step, steps. Actually, it's more like baby steps. Trials are allowed to come our way to test us and to grow us spiritually. This is how we should see our forgiveness of offenses committed against us, as trials, as opportunities to grow spiritually and become more like Jesus. We should see the hand of God in them and in allowing them to come into our lives. We should remember that God is in complete control and as a and as our lives are moving forward, they are doing so as part of his overall plan, which is also moving forward. Genesis chapter 45 illustrates this perfectly. Please turn to Genesis 45, chapter, or, uh, verse 1. Ch Genesis 45, verse 1. We'll read verses 1 through 15. These verses take a look at one of the most beautiful pictures of forgiveness in the Bible. But first, a little background to chapter 45. What has just taken place in chapter 44 is Joseph's brothers are once again in Egypt on their second trip. In chapter 44, jo Joseph stages a theft of his silver cup by having his servant place it in Benjamin's sack, his youngest brother. As he and his brothers leave for the return trip back to Hebron and Canaan, so the sack is in his, uh, the cup is in his sack, the other brothers don't know it. Joseph uses the theft, quote unquote, as a threat to hold Benjamin back as a slave, knowing this would bring about full confession of his brothers. As chapter 44 closes, the brothers still do not know who they, they are talking to, and they plead with Joseph not to keep Benjamin behind as that could end Jacob's life, their father, because of his grief. Joseph and Benjamin were Rachel's sons, and she was Jacob's favorite wife. Joseph and Rachel, or Joseph was Rachel's firstborn, and therefore Jacob's favorite son, and Jacob would show favoritism towards Joseph because of that. But he was hated by his brothers because of this, although th throughout his life, Joseph could do nothing about his position in the family or about the treatment that he received as part of that position. But as we enter chapter 45, as far as Jacob knew, Joseph was dead. If his, younger, if his youngest brother, Benjamin, did not return to Jacob with his other brothers, the anguish and grief could just overcome Jacob. 
So as chapter 45 opens, Joseph is overcome with grief as his brothers plead with him about what could happen to Jacob's health if they do not bring Benjamin back with them. 45 verse 1, Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. Verse 7, And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he made me a pharaoh, a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus is your son Joseph. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. Verse 10. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near to me. And you, your children, and your children's children, your flocks, and your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty, for there are still five years left of famine. Verse 12, And and behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. So you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that you have seen, and you shall hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Joseph forgave his brothers because he trusted God and he saw God's hand in all that happened to him. But it took years for all of this to happen. How would you have handled what Joseph went through? How would I have handled it? Joseph did not have the book of Genesis. He didn't have chapter 45 in front of him. He purposed it in his heart to trust God and to have faith in him on a day-in, day-out basis, no matter how long it took and no matter what he had to go through. We do not see any anger or bitterness in Joseph here. He does remember, but he also completely forgives. Because he remembers and because we remember offenses and wrongs committed against us, this does not amount to unforgiveness but it also does not give us an excuse not to forgive. We remember, but we still forgive. Given all that Joseph's brothers did to him, he could have said this. You wanted me dead. You hated me because my dad loved me. You wanted to kill me, but you didn't. You put me into a hole, and the Midianites took me out of that hole and sold me into slavery, and I was a slave for years. Pharaoh's wife turned on me, and I was put into prison for more years. And now I'm still a slave, but I'm Pharaoh's slave. I have not seen my father in over two decades. I have an Egyptian wife that was forced on me, and I have two children who know nothing about their family. You did that to me, and now you will pay for what you did to me, and you will be my slaves. He didn't say that, but he could have. Or he could have banished them and told them he never wanted to see them or talk to them again. Five years of famine are left. Good luck, brothers. Joseph could have said all that and more, and no one would blame him given what his brothers had done to him. He could have said all that, but he didn't. Instead, he tells him to go get your father and your family and your flocks and your herds and come to me. I will give you the finest land in all of Egypt because I want you close to me, and I forgive you, and I love you. Instead of, <clears throat> instead of pushing him away. Instead of pushing them away or putting them somewhere where he would seldom see them, 
Instead, he gives them the finest land in Egypt, and he has them live close to him, and he kisses them, and he weeps over them. This is the picture of what God has done for us. This is a picture of Jesus. This is a complete picture of complete forgiveness. I ask myself, could I do that under these circumstances? Could you do that? Joseph did not forget, but he forgave because he saw God's hand at work in this entire life. God sent me before you to preserve life, in verse 7. By the grace of God, Joseph does this because he understands the greater story of redemption. As forgiven people, we understand and are grateful for our redemption. Referring to this passage in Genesis, Dr. Vodi Bauckham said this, Our ability to forgive is linked inexorably to our ability to understand the sovereignty of God. When you understand the sovereignty of God, you freely forgive. Joseph, in effect, said to his brothers, God is sovereign, God, of the, God is the sovereign God of the universe, and you did what you did. God is in control of everything, and you did what you did. No attempt to reconcile the two. If you think it needs to be reconciled, then you think God has to explain himself to you. Job tried that. Read chapters 38 through 42 of Job and see what God's response was when Job questioned him. Through the cross of Jesus Christ, God tells us he has forgiven us and that our sin is completely and utterly paid for. He says to us, I want you to be with me. I want you close to me. How can anyone understand what it means to be forgiven and understand the gospel and then turn around and not forgive people who sin against them? No offense committed against us as bad, no offense committed against us is as bad as the wrath we deserve because of our sin. Dr. Bauckham said this, forgiveness, I would argue, is the most significant issue in the Christian life. Why? Because it's where we live. It's our everyday life. We share life with people. End of quote. We live with people such as family members. We associate with extended family. We work with people. We go to church with people. We serve in ministry with people. We're in some kind of association with people every day. Dr. Baca went on to say, you are either on an ongoing, you are either on an ongoing everyday basis, storing up bitterness and anger against someone, or you have learned to forgive them. There is no in between. If you are not a forgiving person, then you are an angry person and a bitter person and a resentful person bent on revenge of some kind. You are either that or you are a forgiving person. You may have learned how to bury and hide your anger and bitterness and resentment, but the truth is it does not bury well. It does not stay buried. It will manifest itself in some way. Forgiveness is not optional for the Christian. It is commanded in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, and in many other places in the Bible. When you are in a relationship with people, especially marriage, forgiveness has to be the norm. You're either living in a state of forgiveness, or you are storing up and attempting to hide anger and bitterness, which of course cannot be done. What is in your heart will manifest itself outwardly in some way that cannot be hidden. The following two comments are from Charles Spurgeon. If we forgive in words only, but not from our hearts, we remain under the same condemnation. We incur greater wrath by refusing to forgive than by all the rest of our indebtedness. Genuine forgiveness is from the heart. It's required of all who have been forgiveness. It's the kind of forgiveness that 1 John 9 refers to, where it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This refers to relational forgiveness. We are called by God to be in a daily flow of confession of sin and in a daily flow of forgiveness by God. Now, referring back to the verses uh, 14 and 15 of Matthew chapter 6 that we read earlier, these verses say that God will give us this relation, that God will give us this relational or daily forgiveness based on our forgiveness of others, but will also withhold it if we do not forgive others from our heart. God holds us accountable for his grace. This means that the Christian is now living not under the blessing of God, but instead under the chastisement or punishment of God. It does not mean they have lost their salvation. It does mean their daily life will reflect ongoing chastisement. 
If you do not live in the state of mind and state of heart of forgiveness and practice it continually, you live in the state of unforgiveness. Then you will question whether, in fact, God has forgiven you. You will be uncertain of your salvation. The unforgiveness that you have toward others will come back to you in that you will be unsure of God's forgiveness of you. Not because you don't understand the doctrine of salvation, but because you do not live the doctrine of forgiveness. Therefore, you will, you will project into God the attitude of unforgiveness that you have toward others. As Jesus says, if you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. Your daily relationship with God will suffer, and you will not be characterized by peace and joy. This whole scenario is more common among Christians than you might think. If I do not forgive someone when, when their sins have been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, then I'm basically saying the crucifixion of Jesus was not enough to pay for what this person did to me. I require more. This is also basically saying that I, the lesser, require more than God, the greater. I'm basically sliding God out of first place in my life and replacing him with me because he has forgiven them, but I have not. Harboring unforgiveness probably tops the list of things that will hinder our relationship with Jesus. It may be one of the toughest battles that many Christians face, but if we will submit and obey with the help of the Holy Spirit, it's a battle that we can win, and it's a prison that we can freed from. Now this moves us into part four of the application, of part four of the outline, which is application, and we're about to finish up. The more we see the purpose of our lives as living to please God instead of living to please ourselves, the more we will want to forgive and to show mercy to others. The more we see ourselves as ambassadors for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the more we'll want to live out the command to forgive others. And finally, as Easter and Good Friday approach, and we visualize ourselves at the foot of the cross, looking up at our Savior who is nailed to it, this question comes to mind. How can I ever refuse to forgive someone? Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for the gift of your son Jesus. We thank you for the gift of the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross so that we can be forgiven, so that we can have the ability through the Holy Spirit to forgive others, so we can live this life as a life of forgiveness, as an example to others around us of what forgiveness looks like, no matter what else is going on in our country, no matter what else is going on in the world. We pray, Lord, that our spiritual nature would overcome our human nature and that forgiveness would dominate our lives as we seek to represent Christ. We thank you, Father, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Let's worship the Lord. <clears throat>